Just in terms of getting started, I'm, you know, I'm quarantining. Tell me about where you are at and how, how life I'm, is. Uh, I'm uh, locked down in, uh, in Stanford, Connecticut, taking each day as it comes. You know, in a funny way, a lot of this is just like every other day for me. I've, I've, always, I've worked out of my house for the last 20 something years. So, you know, to, to a very real degree, my day is, is still my day. And the weekends are weird. Give me a sense of, well, who is Laura Ronica? Right now, Laura Ronica is a part-time writer, part-time publisher, part-time entertainment producer. You know, the, the thing that's actually taking up a, a, an enormous amount of, of our time right now um, is that we've been producing um, audio drama. It's called Little Did I Know. It's actually the first uh, Broadway-level musical podcast ever. Exactly. And, and, this and with a tremendous team of, of people with deep Broadway experience. And, you know, and the book business, which is the, the my core business, um, is in a weird place because, uh, you know, all physical bookstores are closed. Uh, and Amazon has deprioritized books for, you know, a legitimate reason that they, they need to get other things to the consumers instead of books. You're known or famous for a, a different sort of um genre i guess i mean and and that's how i sort of met you i mean science fiction so tell me about sort of that your first love which i think is science fiction yes absolutely my first love was very definitely science fiction yeah i mean that was it was not only you know my first love in the book business but also my first opportunity in the book business um you know i sort of lucked into a situation where i was a an assistant at bantam books um and bantam was the top paperback book publisher in the world at, at the time, and they were great at everything except publishing science fiction. They had they had some impressive titles on their list, but for the most part, they didn't have a real publishing program. And I just sort of took a flyer and and you know convinced the executive team there to let me try to put a science fiction publishing program together. And they said yes. I think they, I think what they really said was, "What the hell?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, well, how, how, how bad could it be? And, 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 uh, and so they let me do it. And, and it turned out to be a program that is now, you know, a, an imprint that's been running for 30 plus years. And you got to write the Star Wars books, or at least the... the well, I didn't write the Star Wars books. I wish I'd written them. No, I, 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 um, I, was, I, I was able to convince Lucas, Lucasfilm to allow books to be written in their universe. That, that was uh, that was a, a big breakthrough for them because they had um, they hadn't actually I mean George Lucas had just de decided not to do more movies um, that was after the, the original trilogy came out and the product and the, and the property was just kind of you know laying fallow and I wrote them a letter and and said you know look if you're not going to do anything with this yeah th this is the most beloved science fiction universe ever you know let me do books. Uh, and a year later, they got back to me and said, "Yeah, that's not a bad idea." Um, and yeah, and that that that's the the Star Wars extended universe that that uh, you know, that sort of reinvigorated the whole the whole program. So tell me about again, because I think it's a good way in in terms of like what what are the trends in science fiction? I mean, you obviously publish science fiction and you write science fiction. So tell me about like. Well, what do we see? How has science fiction changed? I mean, partly because science fiction is, in certain respects, no longer science fiction. Well, sure, and I, but I think that that's always been it's always been one of the challenges for for uh, for science fiction writers is to deal with the fact that they're um, you know that they're outmoding themselves um, and to reinvent because of that. I think the thing that that's happened, and and this is not really new anymore, but it's it's the it's the most significant trend that I've I've seen in the last decade is that the focus is much more on the the effect of technology on people rather than on the technology itself you know in in the you know in the early days of science fiction it was all about ideas and machines and and that sort of thing and now it's very much more about who who is affected by all of this and how they're affected and what they do when they're affected by it you know, about character driven. And there are a writer, a writer named John Scalzi, who publishes for somebody else, does a tr tremendous job of, of capturing the, the human component. Um, you know, writers like Neil Stevenson and, and, uh, and uh, William Gibson have always written books that are at least as focused about 
characters as uh, as they are on uh, on the tech that's behind it. But you know, but I I do think it does relate directly to FM because I think uh, you know the kind of science fiction that 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 he was associated with, and and the his messages um, are very humanist, and they're and they're very much in line with you know with with what I think is resonating most with readers now. Giving the characters very sort of almost some of the, the drama, the conflict is one that is very present or is very um, commonplace, I guess. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to... It... Yeah, and, and also relatable. I think, you know, the, the thing, I, I think, you know, science fiction does two things really well. If, if a really good science fiction writer is doing two, two things well at the same time. They're extrapolating and, and putting new thoughts in our heads. But they're also writing it in such a way that we can actually relate to it. I think FM was really good at that. I mean, you know, they're, they're writing about things that we're experiencing now and showing us what that experience might be like in some other way. Um, and therefore allowing us to reflect on that experience for ourselves. That kind of storytelling is is especially rich at the moment and it does harken back to you know to, to, to people like fm who were doing it you know decades ago there were all sorts of things that we set out to do with our movie and we'll talk about our movie in a second but one of the main things was and this really was i guess a homage to him was to try to make a film that was about the future that wasn't dystopian that certainly wasn't you know projecting a world of problems and lack so how much of how much do you see in the world of science fiction as you know moving in that direction or not moving in that direction? I mean, it'd be, I mean, especially now. Well, yeah, and I think that, you know, it's, it's funny that you, you asked that question because I actually had a, uh, I was having a conversation with a writer this morning where I was trying to advise him to uh, to avoid focusing too much on issues like the pandemic because in a science fiction story. Um, because I think it, we're going to be overwhelmed by those. There, there, there are going to be hundreds of them coming out in the next 18 months. And that is a movement away. I think what was happening was there was, for a long time, dystopian scenarios were the only scenario that, scenarios that were working. Um, and then it did start to, to evolve out of that a little bit. Now I would guess that the dystopian scenarios are coming back. Well, it's, it's the easy choice. I mean, look, I mean, yeah. I think part of it, as, I, as I've thought about it, and you'll have a better sense of this, it's, look, an easy choice is to play on people's fears and nightmares rather than their hopes and dreams, I think. I think it's, in a way, a more um, gripping your seat, I mean, in my world, certainly, than, than sort of trying to project a, a future that has a different set of dramas or... or, or, right. or I mean, look, it's always interesting to see something that is is taking something and doing something different than what everybody else is doing. But can people pull that off is the question. But give me a sort of a sense of what your, you know, as people were moving towards a more um, or a less dystopian place and, and, and are, you, do you think there are stories that are going to get told that, I guess, defy these, these, this, the, these terms? Because that would be very interesting. Oh, I think so. I think no question about it. I think that that's always been true. I mean, there were, you know, there were always writers like Ray Bradbury who were imagining a, you know, a, a, a more, you know, a, a saner, sweeter world, um, you know, it, while lots of other people were, were, you know, telling darker tales. And actually a lot of, a lot of the, the great old science fiction writers actually were super op optimistic, even, even if they didn't, they weren't particularly good at, at capturing it from a human perspective, that I think there'll be an over. It, what always happens, you know, for example, in the in the in the thriller category, you know, when you know when you know after nine eleven there was an, an overwhelming number of you know of terrorist novels that that were published. It's an easy choice, and there's an easy enough audience to reach with that choice. So lots of people go with it. That's what we'll we'll see with pandemic stories and and you know and you know near future dystopian you know worlds you know strafed by viruses kind of, you know stories and that sort of thing but then there will be writers who come on the other side of that who 
um, or in, in the midst of it, uh, with something more human, more optimistic, more instructive in terms of our ability to battle through things. Where does the film we made, 2030, sort of fit in this milieu, if it even does? I mean, obviously, in some ways, it, you know, not, it defies a specific categorization. Yes, anyway. it does. <laughs> and I think that's a great thing. I think it's, it's, it's terrific that it defies categorization. But um, I think film is much more optimistic than a lot of the, uh, of the dark stories. I'm, I'm seeing now because it's, it's offering, it, it's offering a, a, a fairly positive perspective on human potential. You know, I think that's, that's very exciting. I think there are obviously pieces, there's, there's a lot of conflict in the story. Um, and there are pieces of it that aren't as uh, seen as, as optimistic, but I, I think, you know, the overall picture of the, of the, the film is, is a, is a, a life affirming one. So I think when we originally met, I don't know if you'd, I think you may have heard of FM, but you didn't know that much about him. I, I don't right. remember. How has, you know, FM spoke to you either, you know, then when you'd learned about him or, or indeed like, you know, what pieces of that has been enlightening or interesting or, or been a milieu that you're more familiar or have adopted in any way? When he was writing, um, you know, he was writing that felt very optimistic. Um, and felt made made the reader wonder, and and made them you know feel a, a, a greater sense of of human capacity and that sort of thing. Which was you know he had he had contemporaries who were doing uh, similar things. The bulk of his work was uh, was sixties and seventies, right? Yeah, and eighty. I mean, eight, I mean, eighties and nineties. I mean, he wrote "Are You a Transhuman" in the nineties, which in a way was I you know I think to his chagrin in a way was in a way the most popular. And again, at first I thought that he was being flip about it, but I don't, like he felt like if he'd had a bestseller, I mean, he, he, we'd had this discussion a bunch, like he, that would have negated his foresightedness. It's, right, right. I mean, at first I thought he was just being lazy, like, oh yeah, I just don't want to like do this or do that. Or, or, but I really think that he, he, he felt that these weren't science fiction, that these were um, projections, thought out projections that would take work. It's like, we can because we're not, I mean, in his words, we were not resigned to, to the sort of fatalism of the, of the past. That it wasn't, you know, all these things that we thought were a given, whether it was our lifespan or being stuck in a particular job or in a particular marriage or in a particular relationship, that none of these things were fixed anymore. And, th and that, for him, at least, with also these amazing um, pro pr progressions in technology and science, was a way to say we can have this and we're no longer you know mired in this fatalism right. where we're off. i mean i think that was really the message but he would have definitely pushed back he said oh this is science fiction he would have said well actually look at my sources look at this this is actually if it's not happening now we have the capabilities how can we do this uh, much much good science fiction is is based on exactly that yeah, there, there are all, all kinds of writers who prefer not to be, be considered to be as science fiction writers, but what they're writing is science fiction. Um, and they shouldn't run away from it. Writers like Ursula Le Guin sort of broke through that. I mean, it's funny, there's a, there's a great thing, and it's a shame that I don't have the whole thing because it, he's on a panel with Asimov and um, the guy who wrote Future Shock, who was really at him, who they then became friends, apparently. That's awful, yeah. Yeah, top floor. But I mean, I, I was curious to hear like that top Asimov and FM's interactions on that interview, but I don't, for whatever reason, I only have the FM piece of the Oh, that's too bad. Show, because it would have been interesting to hear what, you know, Asimov and him talked about. Or yeah, how well, Isaac was certainly a proud science fiction writer. He didn't, uh, he didn't shy away from it in any way. So the, the movie's come out and we've had some positive reviews and then I get very upset when we have sort of a negative person. Who oh, sure. And I think partly, like, people still don't know what to make of it. I mean, as someone who actually, ha their business is figuring out how to categorize and how then to sell to that category, like, I guess had you been our distributor, you would have been quite frustrated as well, probably. But, but tell me about how that's both... Um, I guess for, on your end, both, uh, well, I was going to say a curse, but perhaps a blessing as well. So maybe there are lessons that we can learn. Well, I think, you know, I mean, you know one of the, you know, it, it's an interesting thing because 
all entertainment industries are sort of facing this at, at the same time that the, the traditional mechanics for reaching an audience have changed so completely that it is now the producer's role, you know, or the publisher's role or whatever, you know, or the distributor's role, depending on where, where one is in the chain, to, to find the individual consumer as opposed to a mass of consumers, which was what the film industry and the book industry and, and the theater industry and all of those were much better at. And the, the tools that they used for finding masses of audiences led to this notion that hybrids were a problem or that, that, um, that, that you needed a pithy log line and that sort of thing in order to, to reach an audience. Most audiences, I mean, most people I know, certainly, don't enjoy one kind of entertainment. I know very few people who, who say, I, I, I only watch mystery shows, you know, or I only read parenting books or, or, or that, that sort of thing. Most people have many touch points in, in their interests. And, and so, you know, a, a film like this that can touch people in, in multiple ways isn't a liability, except if you're trying to make broad marketing statements. And, and I think, you know, what, certainly what I'm seeing in, in the book world, and I think uh, is, is critical for all marketers now, of entertainment at least, um, is, is that you find the, the piece of what you're presenting that aligns well with a specific slice of an audience. And you present it to that audience in that way. And then you present it to a different audience in, in another way and a different audience to another way. And the reason why that can work is because people don't have one kind of interest. So if, if you're reaching out to people who are, are known to be science fiction fans, they're probably going to also be interested in the human drama that, that, that is in the film. Uh, you know, they're, they're also likely to be interested in sort of the, the sociological issues that, that are, are being raised in the film. Um, so you're selling it to them as a work of futurism or a work of science fiction or however, you know, you're playing it for, for that particular audience, but they're responding to the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the issue for me, and I, get, I, get, I take it a bit personally now, perhaps I'm overly sensitive, but is, you know, when people say, I, I was expecting to watch a documentary, and it's not quite a documentary, or I was expecting to watch a thriller, but it seems like a documentary. I mean, peop, you know, it's, it's what people walk in with. I mean, people who then say, oh, you made a movie, like, shall I, I I'll watch it and, like, tell me about it. Like, and I, I'm always like, I'd rather not tell you, not because I'm being reticent, because I feel like the more you sort of walk in with, your own baggage, your own stuff, rather than me saying, oh, it's this or it's that, or this is real, or that's not real, or like, how did it pan out? I mean, look, you know, it's a, then it becomes very surprising because then, you know, there are people who, you know, go off on their own thing, but, you know, you can't control that. The way to, in my opinion, the way to, uh, to navigate through those expectations is, is, is not to, to, to run from any description, because I do think that makes it i think that that causes too many people to say then i'm just not gonna you know if i don't know what i'm getting into i'm not going to get into it at all but rather to to highlight the distinctive nature because you know i think i think there are plenty of people look there are plenty of people who want nothing more than to be taken exactly where they were hoping to go for two hours and those people are not your audience Yes. But I think there's a very substantial audience of people who, who you know, would love to, uh, to w who are looking for freshness, they're looking for something, uh, looking for a story that's being presented to them in a way that they haven't seen it before, and might only be turned off if they didn't know that that was what they were getting. Look, for, for me, it was really about how do we get people to talk and think about some of these ideas because to me not being fm like i don't have such a clear optimistic vision of what will happen for whether it's me or my children I don't, it's not clear i mean we're 
I think we, you and I talked about this, like there are so many, we do certain things and there are so many unintended consequences for the things that we do. Like, are we going to adopt some of these ideas too late? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But I do think that whatever we do, we have to think about. And that was, re I mean, if, if there was any sort of a goal outside of let's make something that's fun and entertaining and interesting, like, you know, w there's conversations to be had. Do you think that that? Well, I think once you decided to not do something traditional, then you had to do something highly ambitious. Because, because I think, I actually think that that's, there, there's very little audience for something that's a little ambitious. A huge audience for something that's very conventional. And I think there's a sizable audience for things that, for projects that take chances. I think there's very little audience, very little audience for something that is a little outside of the box. You know, a little outside of the box just means that the people who want way outside of the box are not going to be satisfied in any way. And the people who are in the box are, are just going to be freaked out by, the, by the, the, the fact that there's some unusual stuff in here. So I think being audacious is, is really the only legitimate play for something like this. The thing that's interesting to me and I, right now is that we almost saw some of this play out, some of the film play out in real time, really about, well, we're hearing it now actually, but we heard it a month or so ago where, you know, certain people were getting tested because they had a lot of money, right. you know. But are there other pieces of the film that kind of spoke to you or you thought were either outlandish when we were talking about them or, you know, resonate more given w where we are at? Well, I think the thing that I, the thing that really resonates, you know, last time I saw it was a couple of weeks ago, but but um, but, you know, the things things that resonate, the thing things in the film that resonate to me now are the optimistic pieces of it, because I think there is a core optimism in the story about, you know, what we're capable of being and what we're capable of having that leads to all kinds of, of really complicated questions. But uh, that's a conversation I'd be delighted to have, you know, at any time about those those complications. That to to me, that was the most resonant piece of the, of the story. Is yeah, we do have to figure out you know, if if the if it's possible to solve some of these problems, then we have to start addressing the next level of problem. But I would be delighted to address the next level of, the, of problem. I mean, some of these questions aren't so cut and dry. I mean. The, the one that really does occur to me now is as people are talking about, you know, these tracking, these, tr these, these ways to track the virus that, that are available, I mean, and that we could do. I mean, do we want to give, you know, corporations that, that part of it? How much is privacy versus security? I mean, we've talk, talked about in terms of terrorism, but now we're talking about in terms of our health, which, you know, it, it was, it's, it's the sort of reverse of, of FM, where it's like, if we don't do some things, this is what we're installing. Right. Yes. As FM was saying, we can do things and this is what's in store for, but it's much better. So your view both as a creative, but also just as a person who wants the best future for yourself and your kids. Well, I think, you know, you know it's funny because the, you, you're talking about, about this not being a national issue and it's really not. I, you know, I, was on, I was on the phone with somebody else this morning from Portugal who's, who's you know, having exactly these conversations about contact tracing and that sort of thing with, uh, with his, you know, his, his peers with the, the predictable range of, of responses. And to me, yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, I tend to default to how didn't we know this? You know, whenever, you know, if a crime is committed, how come we don't have any, you know, any, you know, any of, of figuring out who, who committed that crime or, or, you know, you know, in this, in this case, how, you know, why don't we have a way of, of predicting this more effectively or, or a way of, of following the path of the, of the, the, uh, of, of the outbreak more clearly? I, I'm okay within reasonable limits with giving my data away because I just think it's, it's too important as a society for us to, to, to you know, have as many opportunities to to keep things balanced and and moving forward as we possibly can, yeah. You know, the 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 issue the the issue hap, uh, on the other side is how do you how do you police the people who are are, are managing the data? Um, 
And that's, that's a tougher question to answer. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one thing to say, look, go and do this and we'll, you know, we'll pay you or we won't pay you or you'll get subsidies or whatever. But then, you know, we, we've seen this in real time where, you know, with Facebook, etc., where we've, we've allowed them to do whatever and they've gone and done exactly the opposite. And look, we are living in a time where, again, the monopolistic aspects, and again, that is a theme in science fiction. Or mm -hmm. give out, we give these powers to these, these sort of faceless, faceless companies and they do all sorts of terrible things. Now, again, we're living in such a bizarro world where if you'd have scripted the Trump presidency as a, as a spoof, like everybody would have laughed and no one would have ever oh, believed. Yeah. Unpublishable, yeah. I mean, that's a fact. I mean, that has to be a real factor because, you know, before some of these things were relegated to fantasy or to, you know, absurdist satire. I mean, but it's not anymore. I mean, right. this has to also play out in our creativity. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting question. But I, I just think, yeah, well, the future of satire has completely... Uh, is, 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 is on a completely altered course because of, of what's happening in, in real time now. What's incumbent upon on storytellers is to posit scenarios that are different from the scenarios that we're looking at all the time now. You know, and I think that, and that's always been true for storytellers, but I think it's, it's become, it, the, the job has become a different job because of, the world that we're living in, um, and that was certainly true since 2016, and it's and it's you know overwhelmingly truer now because of, of this. You know, we just have to accept that there's you know there's a whole different set of scenarios that we have to allow ourselves to play out, because if if we don't um, allow ourselves to think audaciously, to think optimistically, to 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 think our way out of problems you know we don't have a role anymore as as storytellers we just don't have a role it you know because if all if all we're doing is is reflecting what what exists now what the our, our current condition that's happening that's happening 24/7 on you know uh, you know on cable networks uh, you know, and and on the internet you know as as you were talking, I was thinking about the idea of nemesis is and you know, in, in terms of their relationship with protagonists and so on. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder how people are going to sort of nuance their villains or just go full up, full hog, and that's going to be okay because we've had them. I mean, I, you know, it does, it is interesting. Well, you know, it, it's funny. It, it's an interesting thing to consider because I think in the fiction world, the, there was a, a very strong movement away from, from any kind of villain that felt stereotyped at all, except in certain kinds of, you know, rah-rah, you know, thriller fiction or that sort of thing. But um, most really successful writers of novels of conflict had become, um, you know, fairly adept at, at nuancing their, their, their villains. Because what they found was that, you know, that readers weren't responding to the, uh, the mustache, mustache uh, twirling uh, villain anymore or you know you know or the you know you know the, the cliched arab villain or you know the cliched russian villain or or that that sort of thing um i think what stuns so many writers in watching what's playing out now is that the the what, what we're seeing on the news is is stuff that we would we would have rejected as as a choice for 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 a fit, for a novel because it, it, of how preposterously you know cliched it is and how transparent it is. Yeah, you know, I, I think I, I would guess that um, that storytellers are going to double down on nuancing their characters. That they're not going to they're they're going to resist the urge to turn them all into. Uh, Pick your populist leader. <laughs> that should be like you should do a competition. Pick your populist leader. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't get over that. On one, on the one hand, like here we are releasing this film, you know, within a pandemic, and 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 if nothing else, like you know, FM did posit a more equitable, fairer world with you know specifics in terms of what we should invest in and what we should focus on, and so on. I mean. 
there's part of me that you know could easily get depressed about this you know that we've released this now and it's you know we always knew it was going to be sort of countercultural because you know it's easy to sort of prey on people's fears than to sort of prey on this other thing right there's, there seems to be a lot of irony around this mm. uh, pessimism cynicism whatever you want to call it now and are there lessons are we not going to learn the lessons that we should i i would guess that um that the people who are, are, are lobbying to to open beaches and bowling alleys today <laughs> um, aren't learning any lessons at all. I, I think what uniquely op optimistic about this condition is that it's given everybody some extra time to think and some extra time to appreciate what they had and to imagine a better way to play this out going forward. So I do, I do think that, um, and I, you know, and I, and I do think that the film sort of applies to that. You know, that I, I, I think we're getting to the point now. I think there was definitely, you know, the first several weeks after the lockdown, um, there was an enormous run on films like Contagion and uh, and Virus and. And that sort of thing, but now that's sort of, you know, I think the the second wave is is hitting. I think this is probably ready for the third wave. Yeah, you know, the second wave is mindless entertainment. Just really, just I I, I just want to laugh, you know, or I just want to watch a love story, or or whatever it is, or I just want to watch lots of spaceships, or that that kind of thing. But I think that the wave that comes beyond that will be, I want something that that suggests to me that there's some really good stuff happening in the future. Um, and I would think that having this film ready for that wave, which could be as soon as, you know, three or four weeks from now, um, might be a really good thing. This idea of lessons learned, because we, you know, if we look at our history, there are so many things that happen, including the, the Spanish flu after the First World War, like where we haven't learned lessons, where we just repeat the same things again and again. You know, I remember a discussion that we had when we were talking about trans, I think you and I had it, but um, which was the idea of transhumanism, which can get very sort of muddy. Mm -hmm. but you have to have a, there's a different question to be had, like if we're going to be beyond human or in this nether world of like, you know, e evolution, like, well, it is about well, what, what makes us human right now and what do we want to keep? Yeah. Uh, and do, do you, as, a, as a, somebody who's putting out creative material and is a creative yourself, all right? Like, how do you, what responsibility do we have is one question. Well, I mean, I, I think the evidence is that we have learned lessons. And, you know, it, it's, I, I think, you know, the, to default to we haven't learned every lesson, so we haven't learned any lessons is not, productive in any way. And I think we have learned an enormous number of lessons about, you know, about taking care of ourselves, about, about taking care of each other, um, even taking care of the planet, even though we're doing a terrible job of it, we have learned lessons about that. This didn't happen because we failed to, to understand what happened during the Spanish flu. It happened for far more complex reasons than that, obviously. But, but I, I think there's an enormous amount of evidence that we have evolved sociologically. You, you can either look at the world as, you know, it's not utopia, so there, therefore it's dystopia. Or you can look at it as it's a utopia in progress. <laughs> um, and I choose to, to, to do that. But I also think as, as storytellers, we have an enormous responsibility to bring that forward. But bring it forward in a way that, in, in as bulletproof a way as, as realistically possible. You know, I don't think, I don't think there's any room now. I think, I, I think there's no, you know, no appetite for, um, for blind optimism. You know, none whatsoever. Um, but I think there is a desperate hunger for reasoned op optimism. You know, there's, there's a real desire among the people I'm talking to, among what I'm reading, um, for, for people who, who say, 
fully aware of all the problems and fully aware of uh, problems that we have only begun to contend with, here is a, a course that we could follow. I, I think there's an enormous, that's a, a responsibility that we have to take as, as storytellers. It's, it, it, it's a critical one. Um, and I see that at every level. I, you know, I have the same conversation with you know, people who are writing relationship stories as you and I are having now. You know, I, I literally a couple of days ago had this conversation about, you know, a, a, with, with a writer who's writing a novel about, you know, fatherhood. And, and that story is, it, it, it's just a different scale, but it's the same story. You've got it, you, you know, you, you, know you, can't, you, know, you can't do the Hallmark version of that story. People aren't responding to the Hallmark. I mean, they're, I guess they are on Hallmark, but, but in most places they're not responding. But there's an enormous appetite for a nuanced version of what it means to be a, a, a father who has not been fantastic at his job and how many opportunities he, he gets to, to, to fix that. It's the, same, it's the same construct, just a different scale. But are, what are the things that we have to, you know, if there is this journey from beyond human or, or ways that we're gonna become something different, like what are the pieces for you that, we think, that you think we should retain and what are the pieces that we can either eliminate through some means or another what 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 are they <laughs> well that's 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 a very tough question to answer uh, yeah. but, but look i uh, look, i think that the, to me that the thing that um you know the the thing that is absolutely always worth keeping and you know and this is going to sound like a, a greeting card but is, is is the you know is human caring i mean that you know to me you know the thing the thing that i remain you know endless that makes me you know remain optimistic is just seeing my children and seeing people I care about trying, you know, and, and that, and, and, and the fact that that means something to me and would mean to something to most people uh, and most people would be able to say that is something that we absolutely should re retain. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't, it doesn't have to be in a traditional family, you know, construct or, or anything like that. But I, the idea that there is a, a, a small circle of people who matter more than, than everybody else to you is actually something that I think is really critical to retain. And then to build out from, you know, I think the, you know, the, the thing to me, the thing that, that we most desperately need, putting all technology aside, the thing we most desperately need is to learn how to commune better once you start caring for more people and caring for more things, then you start caring for your environment more and you start caring for, for, you know, the other inhabitants of the planet more and you start caring about the, the universe more and, and all of, all of that. Because I think, you know, if, if you're only learning that, that you, that there are people close to you who matter to you, you haven't really learned very much. If, if what you're also learning is, and, everybody else has that too and and therefore that's the most common thing that we have and there are no borders to that i think it it really fundamentally changes how you approach the world so 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 see, you know it's funny because i mean like I, I'm, we, you and i probably never talked about this because uh, but but i'm a very big sports fan i i love sports and i love having a sports team to root for. And because I'm in the New York area, the sports teams I root for tend to be teams that, that other people root adamantly against. And I actually love the fact that other people care about their teams as much as I care about my team. And while I don't want their team to win, I completely sympathize with their desire for their team to win. And I think that's sort of, I mean, it's a, it's a silly, it's, it's a silly example, but it, but in some ways it, it speaks directly to this, the difference between nationalism and globalism, because if you can, if you can take pride in your community or your neighborhood or your house or whatever it is, and also take pride in everybody else's community and, and, and their, and the, take pride in the pride that they take in their community then you're not, you're not setting up, you're not putting up walls. 
Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I, I you know, it's a, it's a, it's a funny thing. I, th I think one can do that. I mean, you've just illustrated that. It's like whether we do. I mean, because it's much easier to be like, fuck them. You know. Yeah. And I, I think yeah, I, it's, it's just there's just no no need in a relatively abundant world. There's no need to 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 to, to take those kinds of positions. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much.